like to start off by giving you a little glimpse into my personality. In this first picture, you see me as a wee child at Easter, being forced into a ridiculously staged photograph by my camera happy father. As you can see, I am thrilled to be wearing a stupid frilly dress and rabbit ears. In this second picture, you see me on the sidewalk in front of our house, where all of the neighbors can see my indignity. <laughs> and here's me having had enough. I don't know exactly what I was saying during this moment, but it was probably something along the lines of, raise that camera one more time, and I will end you. What you can see by this example is I have a little bit of an anger problem. And the way that I, as an introvert, yes, I am an introvert, dealt with that anger was to silently seethe with rage until I could figure out some outlet for that anger that was more productive than, say, manslaughter. <laughs> Believe me when I tell you that figuring out these alternate outlets has not been easy. So how did I get from infant rage monster to where I am now? Well, it began in my young adulthood. I studied preventive medicine in graduate school, and this was a time when the disease that we now know as HIV and AIDS was making its mark on the world. As I learned more about this disease, I was also making a wider social network of friends, friends who were gay and lesbian, friends who were directly affected by this disease because of how many friends of theirs had already died from it. It struck me that the people who had died were young, they were very young. At this time, it also struck me that we knew what caused HIV and AIDS, and we knew how it was transmitted and not transmitted. But there were still people who didn't know this information. There were still people who didn't have access to health care. There were still people who couldn't access the drugs that could possibly save their lives because the research pipeline was so slow and the drugs were so expensive. There were people who were told that they deserved to die from this disease. And this made me angry. Actually, it made me furious. I was infuriated that people my age were dying from a completely preventable disease. I was infuriated that people were dying and the government in Washington, D.C. was remaining largely silent about this epidemic. That was when I knew that HIV prevention was my calling. And I knew that the people that I needed to focus on in my work were those who were most vulnerable, most marginalized in society. Those were my people. Included in this new category of my people were injection drug users. Injection drug users are often at risk from HIV, from sharing their needles and syringes, their works, their injection equipment. Often people will share because they don't have access to clean injection equipment and are desperate to use to stave off the symptoms of withdrawal. By using clean works every time and not sharing syringes, getting those used syringes out of circulation, people could still use but be protected from getting and spreading HIV. This is exactly what harm reduction strategies like needle exchange do. They provide access to clean injection equipment and get those used works out of circulation. And that's the elegant and simple beauty of syringe exchange and harm reduction. Addiction is terribly, terribly hard. Not everyone is ready to quit using. That doesn't mean that drug users don't care about their health. It just means that they're not ready to take that really difficult next step. And that's what harm reduction programs do. They meet people at where they're, where they're at in their addiction, provide them with services that they need to protect their health while they are still actively using drugs until they're ready to get that next step for help. Syringe exchange programs are also highly effective. In the time since syringe exchange programs have been implemented in the United States, the numbers of injection-related transmissions of HIV have dropped by over 80%. As a young researcher, I knew about this literature. I was excited about it. I was happy to talk about this to anyone who would listen. That is, until I became a federal employee in a conservative administration. 
as a program officer for HIV prevention clinical trials for injection drug users. I would travel to various places in the world and meet with our research teams and our participants. And I would talk to community members who were thrilled to have these programs in their community. They thought this was great to help keep the HIV negative people negative. But HIV positive people needed something as well. And they knew the literature on syringe exchange. They knew about its effectiveness, and they thought that this, in addition to our program, was what they needed to help fight their epidemic. And could I please help them start a syringe exchange program? The problem was that I couldn't. The administration believed that syringe exchange was tantamount to promoting and condoning drug use, despite the research evidence showing no association between syringe exchange programs and increased drug use or increased crime. There was also legislation that forbade the use of federal funding for such programs. And I, as a federal employee, could not even say the words syringe exchange or harm reduction. I was a federal employee, but I was also a scientist. And this pissed off scientist did not take kindly to being censored. So I left that job and went into policy and advocacy work. I would channel my anger into changing these policies. In addition to the ban on the use of federal funding for syringe exchange, there is also a special situation in the District of Columbia. You see, despite this federal ban, Every state, city, and locality had the autonomy to use their own revenue to support syringe exchange programs if they so desired. Every city, except Washington, D.C., which was subject to congressional oversight. D.C., which in 2007 had a 3% prevalence rate of HIV in an area of 68 square miles. To put this in perspective, a generalized epidemic is one in which there is a greater than 1% prevalence rate in the general population. Nigeria has a 3.1% prevalence rate and is ranked 20th in the world in terms of HIV prevalence. The US has a 0.6% prevalence rate and is ranked 65th in the world in terms of HIV prevalence. If the District of Columbia were a country, it would be ranked 21st in the world in terms of HIV prevalence. D.C., in which injection-related transmissions accounted for 18% of the living cases of AIDS in the city. D.C., in which transmission by injection drug use affected the city's most marginalized citizens in the city's most disadvantaged neighborhoods. D.C., which was the only place in the United States that could not use its own revenue to respond to its own epidemic. This was a city of people being held captive by a law that was created by legislators who did not represent them. And naturally, this made me angry. <laughs> Fortunately, I was not alone in my anger. My colleagues in advocacy and policy and I worked hard to try to get this language removed so that prevention services could be available to injection drug users. In December of 2007, President George W. Bush signed the 2008 Financial Services Bill into law. For the first time in 10 years, this legislation did not contain language that prohibited D.C. from using its money for syringe exchange. That meant for the first time in 10 years, D.C. could use its own money to respond to its own epidemic. In early 2008, Mayor Adrian Fenty allocated $650,000 to the D.C. Department of Health to expand syringe exchange to reduce infection for injection drug users. The money went to four organizations to create a network to provide comprehensive harm reduction services, including syringe exchange, to the city's injectors. So I thought this was amazing. Finally, we had achieved this victory, this progress. But the researcher in me said, we've got to evaluate this. We've got to see if this change in policy really had an impact on the number of new infections associated with injection drug use. When I left the world of advocacy and joined GW as faculty, writing a grant to answer this research question was my first order of business. To my great delight, the proposal was funded. 
I assembled a team, and we began our work. And here's what we found. In this graph, the blue line, the blue wavy line, represents HIV surveillance data reported by the DC Department of Health. These are HIV infections associated with injection drug use. And we looked at the period following the implementation of that policy change. That's the red vertical line you see up there. That's when the policy change actually took effect. What the surveillance data show is that in those two years following the implementation of the policy change, we saw 176 HIV infections associated with injection drug use. Now, our team used mathematical modeling and time series analysis to estimate what would have happened had that policy not changed, had the things remained the same. Our models found, or estimated, 296 infections would have occurred in that same two-year time period. 296 expected infections versus 176 actual infections. This is the difference of 120 averted infections due to the fact that DC could use its own money for syringe exchange to respond to its own epidemic. What does this mean in terms of cost savings? The majority of DC residents who are receiving HIV care are doing so through publicly funded insurance programs that are supported by taxpayer dollars. HIV is a chronic manageable disease now, which is fantastic, but it's not cheap. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that it costs approximately $380,000 for a lifetime of HIV care. If you multiply that $380,000 times 120 averted infections, what you get is a cost savings of $45.6 million in two years. With the, while this estimate does not take into account the treatment of co-infections, such as hep C and addiction, it does attest to the fact that syringe exchange not only provides individual benefit, but it provides community benefit. So this is pretty cool, right? I think so. You're probably thinking, well, Monica, there's no need to be angry anymore. Your research has been successful. These findings are cool, they're great. It's all good, right? Wrong. The anger persists. The anger persists because in this fourth decade of this epidemic, and with much better and more effective HIV prevention and treatment options, there are still young men and women being infected with a completely preventable disease. The anger persists because there are still people in this country of all ages, all races, all genders, and all political affiliations who do not have access to care or who are at risk of having their health care be taken away. The anger persists because in 2017, we are still being told that we deserve negative health and social outcomes because of who we are, who we love, how we worship, or where we're from. The anger persists because we are living in an age where science continues to be denied, threatened, and censored. These are perilous times for social justice. So what's my advice to you? Stay angry, my friends. Stay angry. Thank you.